Okay. Recording stopped. So our final speaker for, um, excuse me. Recording in progress. Our final speaker uh, is our keynote speaker, uh, and that is Karen Howard, again, the U.S. Government Accountability Office's acting chief scientist, and she is going to talk about streaks, signals, and space junk facing the challenges of satellite constellations. Karen? Good morning, greetings everybody. It's an honor to be here. I especially appreciate following Piero's talk because many of the points he made are points that resonate with me and the work I do. I do work for the Government Accountability Office, which uh, is an agency that even in the United States most people don't know about. So let me give you a brief introduction. My agency exists to support Congress. Our job, in particular in my team, the science and technology team within that agency, is to help Congress, the U.S. Congress, understand science and technology advances and the policy implications of those. So my work is really very much at the intersection of science and policy and bringing those two together. I am not an astronomer or an astrophysicist. I am far less expert in all of these topics than those of you out there in the theater and also remotely participating. What I do, though, is I help translate those topics for Congress. And so as Piero talked about, the satellite operators and the astronomers often speak a different language. When you throw Congress and parliaments and, and lawmakers into that mix, they speak yet another language. Our job in, at GAO is to bridge those gaps. We have the scientists and engineers who can understand and, and talk to researchers in the field and satellite operators and people with great technical skills, and then they learn how to translate that for the policymakers, the lawmakers in Congress. That is our role as an agency. So as you hear me talk about this report, the things I'm going to tell you are not going to be news to you. I'm going to give you an overview of what's in the report. The cover of the report is shown on the slide that you're looking at right now. And there is an active link there. So when you're able to uh, go to the slides online, you'll be able to download this report. It is free. It is public. And a lot of details are in there. I'm going to just skim the surface of it and give you a sense of what was in there. And as you listen, think about this in terms of this report was written for the U.S. Congress to try to help them understand this field. What is going on? What are the challenges? What might be done? And what is the path forward? That's very much the context in which this report was written. It was published one year ago, almost exactly, on September 30th, 2022. So the research has progressed since then. I'm definitely excited to hear the talks for the rest of this week. Very grateful that the uh, U.S. Congress managed to postpone the crisis of not funding our government so that I don't have to fly home this afternoon uh, and so I can stay for the rest of the conference. I'm really looking forward to learning from all of you who are the experts in this field. Although I personally am a chemist and not a, a person who works primarily in the space field, and as Connie so eloquently expressed in her introduction of me, I work across the breadth of science and technology. That's my role as a director, is to know a little bit about a lot of things so that I can talk to Congress about those topics. But I did have a team working for me who consisted of a, an aerospace engineer, a systems engineer, three physicists, and an atmospheric scientist. So we did have real technical credentials on our team. In addition, they did a complete literature review of what was available at that time in the published literature. They also spoke with many federal government agencies in the United States to talk to their experts and their program leaders to understand the state of the U.S. federal aspects of this. And we also convened a multi-day expert meeting to gather views from government, from academia, from satellite operators, and a number of other stakeholders in the field. So we did go out and collect a lot of viewpoint, excuse me, viewpoints, synthesize those viewpoints, and use them to produce the report that, that you see there on the screen and that I'm going to very briefly talk about today. So why are we talking about this problem and something we were trying to help Congress understand? And this graph did that job very beautifully. This graph runs from 2013 on the left to 2022 on the right, so a 10-year period. And you can see the dramatic increase in the number of satellites. In 2013, just over 1,000 active satellites in orbit around the Earth. And 10 years later, in April of 22, about uh, 5,500 were actively in orbit at that time, so a dramatic increase over that period. The most recent official data we were able to bring to bear for this conference from the U.S. Uh, 
data archives was as of January 2023, so about nine months ago. There were about 6,700 satellites actively in orbit at that time. So in the nine months from April 2022, when this graph ends, to January 2023, about 1,200 satellites were added to space. It has now been another nine months since January 2023 until now, so we can assume that about that number or more have again been added, and we're probably approaching the 8,000 active satellites in orbit region, somewhere in that neighborhood. Of those, the vast majority are in low Earth orbit, LEO. The effects we talked about in our report in trying to help Congress get a broad overview of this issue were uh, rocket emissions from launches, radio transmissions from the satellites themselves back down to Earth, sunlight reflections from the satellites, orbital debris, satellite re-entry, which produces both emissions and fragments, and those fragments that survive re-entry present a human casualty risk and potentially a property damage risk to the Earth when they land. So I'm going to briefly touch on each of those and sort of the overview we gave for the Congress in each of those areas. Light reflection effects, of course, as you are all well aware, uh, affects ground-based optical astronomy, particularly, experts told us, for wide field imaging telescopes. And this image that you see here will be much easier to read on the report if you download it, but that is attempting to give Congress an understanding of what field of view is for a telescope and how it affects the uh, impact of satellites in the streaks and the signals as they, as they pass through the sky. Uh, these effects are, of course, most problematic in the hours before dawn and after dusk and when satellites are very close to the horizon, also when they're higher at higher altitudes in low Earth orbit. Of course, in addition to the effects on optical astronomy, the reflections also have an effect on cultural and religious use of the night sky. These are very important effects that you're going to hear more about this morning from other speakers. And, and I, I put to a lesser degree, I don't mean that it's less important. What I mean is it's not yet viewed by the public as much of a problem. It also affects amateur astronomy and astrophotography. Uh, the public, at least in the United States, where I am most familiar with, is still kind of excited about seeing a Starlink satellite go by in the sky. So they, they don't view it yet as a problem. And that's why I mentioned that it's to a lesser degree it affects them. In addition to affecting Earth-based astronomical observations, obviously it affects space-based missions as well. So we think about instruments that are placed in orbit around the Earth. Some of them, like Hubble, are looking out to space. Some of them are looking back down at Earth. And the presence of additional satellites, this ever-increasing number of satellites, is beginning to cause some more significant problems to those instruments as well. Uh, these pictures were recently published in a paper in Nature Astronomy. So, Space-based astronomy, such as the Hubble telescope, for example, uh, literature that we read indicated that about 2% of Hubble images are currently affected by satellite constellation reflections. It was about 6 to 8% of stacked images, and estimates indicate that in the future it could reach 16% or more of Hubble images will be affected by satellite constellations. So again, it's not that these problems are new. They existed even when we had 1,000 satellites, even when we had 500 satellites orbiting the Earth, but the scale has increased so dramatically that it, it has drawn such increased attention. Space-based space Earth science, where the instruments are looking down at Earth, are also affected. And we talked to scientists at NASA who told us, for example, one of their satellites, the ICESat-2, they told us they have to turn it off every other day to avoid affecting the satellites that are between them and the Earth. So they use lasers, masers, LIDAR, pointed down at the Earth as that travels through the atmosphere and back up. They detect it, and it gives them data that they're looking for on on weather, on wildfire smoke, on ice coverage, on a lot of different things, depending on which satellite you're talking about. And they worry about sending those lasers down and hitting another satellite and potentially damaging it, or damaging their own detectors. When they send a signal down that, that their detectors are set to a sensitivity because they're assuming the beam is going to go all the way to Earth and come all the way back up and be reduced in strength as it passes through the atmosphere twice. If instead it bounces off a satellite and comes back, it will come back much stronger than they anticipated, and it could damage their detectors. So NASA and other space agencies, I assume for other countries and regions as well, are very concerned about this in terms of damage to their own and to other satellites. As we were trying to explain to Congress some of the potential mitigations that that we're aware of and that experts made us aware of in this area. Satellite design choices are certainly one of them. Satellites could be designed to be less reflective, whether that's the materials they're made of, the coatings that are used, using sunshades. There are a variety of things we heard that could reduce the reflectivity of satellites. 
They also, uh, experts also told us that we need to develop models that can better predict the brightness of a satellite while it's still in the design phase. So while aerospace engineers are designing the satellite itself, they can input the, the material it will be made of and the shape it will have and the anticipated orbit location and, and speed and so on, and the model will tell them how bright it's going to be. And they can make design choices at that stage before it's been built that can reduce the brightness of that satellite. We can collaborate on orbit assignments. This is currently not done, at least not to any significant degree. Uh, every country sends their own satellites into orbit. Every commercial country, uh, every commercial company sends its satellites into orbit, and there's not a lot of coordination on where those go. Perhaps with better collaboration and better coordination, that might help mitigate some of the reflection concerns that we see. We can also do a much better job of sharing data, and you're going to hear this throughout my talk. It's something we emphasized over and over to Congress in the report that there's not a lot of data sharing going on. Satellite companies have some data. They know, for example, what their satellites are made of. They know where they are, how fast they're moving, the track they're following. They don't often share that data. They're not required to, and so they generally don't. If ground-based astronomy had a better sense of where the satellites are going to be and when, they could perhaps adjust their data collection windows to try to avoid the worst effects of satellites. And, and vice versa. Satellite companies, satellite operators told us that if they had a better idea which uh, astronomical observatories on Earth needed which times of the night sky, that perhaps they could adjust their operations to try to help. Again, none of these is a 100% mitigation, right? But each step taken together could help us get a handle on this problem. And finally, something we can do sort of after the fact, after the satellite has already gone by and it appears in the image, as you see in these images here, is image processing excuse me, processing software, which already exists, but could be improved pretty dramatically. So that's an area where we could make technological advances that might be helpful. Satellite effects on radio astronomy, another topic that we explained to Congress and tried to help them understand. Radio transmissions are one of the most difficult things to mitigate, experts told us, even harder than, than reflectivity, although reflectivity gets a lot of press because the lay public can see it. They can see the satellite streaks as the satellites move through the sky. Radio astronomers, as you well know, and as we were explaining to Congress, are trying to detect very, very faint radio signals that are coming from very far away. And if a satellite goes by, it's basically the equivalent of somebody driving by in their car with their radio on really, really loud, and it drowns out every other noise until it has passed far enough away that you can start to hear the local noise again. And that's the situation that radio astronomy faces when satellites go by. Uh, the signals of interest go across a range of frequency bands, and this is another problem. It's not just one part of the spectrum that's affected. It's a, it's a broad spectrum. I will note that while regulators bear a lot of responsibility here, and we've written other reports, not so much in this one, although we mention it in this one, but we have another report specifically focused on the U.S. federal agency that licenses satellites for launch, and uh, that's the Federal Communications Commission. And they, are, they have some areas where they could definitely improve, and we make recommendations to them for improvement in those reports. But they do have a very difficult task, and I want to acknowledge that. There's a limited amount of spectrum. There are a lot of interested users of that spectrum, and trying to weigh that and balance that, not only in the U.S., but in other countries and other regions as well, is a thankless job. And it's a very hard job. And uh, while they don't do it as well as they could, I do want to acknowledge that, that it's a difficult task. Mitigating some of those effects, again, thinking about the design of the satellites first, the design could be uh, adjusted to perhaps reduce the effects somewhat. For example, experts told us satellites could be designed to narrow the radio signal beam they're sending back down to Earth so that as it passes over, it affects the radio astronomy instrument for a lesser period of time because the beam is narrower. Timing is also important. Again, satellite operators could adjust the timing to avoid those windows that are most critical for radio astronomy. And here again, you're going to see data sharing coming up on this list down at, at the third bullet. Satellite operators told us that they had a better understanding of the radio astronomy needs. What are the frequencies you're looking at and when? How can we adjust our satellite positioning for the satellites that use the same frequencies you're trying to, to uh, collect, for example, so that we don't interfere with your collections? We found in our discussions with satellite operators that they were very willing to do the mitigations that were fairly easy for them, right? So take advantage of that would be my encouragement for you. Let them uh, go ahead and give you the low-hanging fruit. There will be areas that will be harder to, to deal with, right? There will be uh, discussions that will be more contentious, likely, uh, between your needs and their needs, as Piero so, so capably expressed. But there are places where there is low-hanging fruit and where perhaps agreement could be reached fairly quickly. 
We need to strengthen protections, experts told us, for spectrum and for radio astronomy observatories. And this falls into the dark and quiet skies that Piero again was talking about. Experts told us that the protections that currently exist were largely designed for ground-based interference sources, whether those are light or radio frequency, but things that were also based on the ground. They need to be updated for space-based interferences and uh, tightened a little bit for that area. It's something that experts mentioned. And radio telescopes also could be adjusted, the experts told us, based on uh, hardware advancements. They mentioned things like reference antennas. The report talks about this a little bit more, but some technologies that can help to back out those satellite signals so that the, the pure radio data that you're seeking from space are more visible underneath, more uh, auditorily visible, so to speak. Chemical emissions into the atmosphere. As a chemist, this is the section that I understand the best. Uh, launches obviously put emissions into the atmosphere, gases like chlorine and, and nitrogen oxides, NOx, also particles like black carbon and alumina. Launch emissions are fairly well understood depending on the rocket propellant that's used and uh, the, the design of the rocket and, and several other factors. The problem is that we don't really know how significant a contribution they are, particularly as the number of launches has increased dramatically. Again, it's the scale that is causing the greatest problems at the current time. So we need better data on that. Disintegration and reentry can also produce emissions, but these are far less well understood and far more exotic in a chemical sense. So when a, a rocket body comes back through the atmosphere and, and disintegrates, it, you're talking about paints and resins and electronics and sometimes batteries and, you know, a variety of things that as they burn can give off a lot of very exotic emissions. We don't understand those emissions very well at all in terms of, of uh, the volume of emissions that are going into the atmosphere during reentry and based on the different satellite and other debris composition. Disintegration, uh, I'm sorry, it, all of this depends on the types of rocket propellants in the satellite composition, as I mentioned. Mitigating those, number one is collecting data. This is an area where experts told us we have very, very little data. We need better data on emissions. Perhaps there's not even really a problem here because we don't know. We don't know how great the volume is. And as we, as we try to scale up and look into the future as all of these satellites that have now gone into orbit, begin to fail and re-enter, we don't have good data that allows us to build models that predict what is going to happen when that number of satellites are re-entering the atmosphere. Once we have better data, we can establish metrics to compare the emissions to other sources of emissions that warm the atmosphere and that damage the ozone layer. Are these significant contributors? We don't know. It could be that when we have enough data, we'll decide this is such a minor player in atmospheric warming and ozone depletion that it's not worth our attention, that other areas need more focus. But until we have the data, we don't really know that. Once we uh, are gathering those data, we should coordinate them into an emissions database that is accessible to all so that, uh, again, those data can be used across the international community. Satellite operators could do a much better job of sharing satellite composition data. They don't tell us much about what's in their satellites, what they're made of, and therefore it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen when they re-enter. Or if they fail in space and explode or get hit by another piece of debris or something along those lines. We just don't have a good sense of what they're adding in terms of chemical composition to the problem. Once we have better, a better understanding of the magnitude of this problem, perhaps it will seem appropriate to develop regulations or guidance for uh, rockets based on that, that collected data and for satellite composition as well. Orbital debris, not a new problem. We've known about orbital debris for decades. Again, the issue now is scale. Orbital debris comes from a variety of sources, which is what this graphic is representing. In the top left corner, two pieces of debris collide with each other and fracture and create more debris. In the bottom left, an active satellite collides with a piece of debris and that generates more fragments. In the upper right, a satellite itself might fail. Either a residual propellant might explode, the batteries might explode. Uh, it might just start to fall apart. That sometimes happens, according to experts we talk to. And in the bottom right, one of the more dramatic examples, we've seen a few of these recently, is an anti-satellite weapon taking out a satellite, which creates an enormous quantity of debris. Probably a really bad idea to use anti-satellite weapons in terms of the, the orbital debris problem. Orbital debris is varied in size, as you all know. Again, think about this in terms of us trying to explain it to Congress. It, it ranges from everything from parts of space stations or rocket bodies, very large pieces of material, to specks of dust uh, and smaller. Some of those pieces, particularly the larger ones, are fairly trackable, although not with the precision we would like. We don't have good enough tools to track them very precisely in terms of their position. 
but many of them are not trackable at all. More satellites equals more debris equals more risks. This increases diffuse night sky brightness, uh, which is something you're going to hear about in a later talk today as well. There are, of course, the more debris you have, the more reentry you're going to have over time, and that creates more emissions risks and, of course, human casualty risks for those pieces that do not fully burn up. Mitigating some of these challenges, the number one thing that we heard over and over from our experts is we need better space situational awareness. In other words, we need to better understand where satellites are, the paths they're following, and improve our models tracking those pathways. So in the graphic, what we're trying to show in the top panel is two items in space moving toward each other, one in blue, one in orange, and they, we're representing those as ovals, and those ovals are position uncertainties. So we don't know very precisely exactly where those items are, so we have a rather large ovals on them. The models show them coming toward each other, and the ovals intersect. But we don't have good enough data to know if the objects are actually going to collide, because remember, the ovals are the uncertainty around the position. If we had better space situational awareness, like in the bottom figure, the ovals are tighter because we have a better understanding of where these things are, and the models can now see that those two pieces are actually going to miss each other. So very useful information for avoiding uh, the problem of creating more debris and damaging potentially active and useful assets that are up in space. Everything from there down, all the rest of the bullets, are aspirational. They are things that are in the research phase, in the design phase, perhaps some of them in, in light pilot phase, but they are future enhancements. Things like reducing new debris. Can we build satellites in a way that, that they don't fail in space and parts fall off? We know that has happened in the past. Uh, can, we, can we do things along those lines just to try to reduce new debris being added to what's already up there? Could we alter or remove the debris that's up there? There are researchers working on the possibility of spacecraft going up, collecting debris, bringing it back to Earth. It's, it's a futuristic thing, right? It's down the road. It's not a capability we have yet, but it's something that is being looked at from a research perspective. Repurposing existing debris. Some of the debris contains very valuable materials that could be reused again for something else, recycled. Think of it along those lines, if it could be collected and used. So researchers are working on that possibility. We could design satellites for disintegration, but of course there are trade-offs with that. So if you're trying to reduce the human casualty risk and the property damage as something re-enters in an unexpected location and hits the Earth, we could instead design them so they burn up completely in the atmosphere. That's good for a human casualty and a property risk perspective, but it might be bad from an emissions perspective. So we need to think about the trade-offs that are involved there. And we could better control satellite reentry location, but also timing. We could design satellites so that they reenter at an appropriate time after their end of life, and that they reenter in a controlled manner at a controlled place so that we know where they're going to land and we can avoid the harms that could occur. And then let me move into policy options. So this is where we're trying to express to Congress what could be done about all of these problems. And that we have some common challenges, right? And by common, I mean across the international stakeholder community that is involved in space. That's the operators, that's governments, that's astronomers, that's casual users of the night sky, cultural users of the night sky. All of these stakeholders share some common challenges. Those include an insufficient knowledge of some of these effects. Some of them, as you heard, we don't have a lot of data on. So we need better knowledge. We need just better data. And that's where a lot of you as researchers come into play. We have insufficient technology development. We're not expending enough resources to develop the technologies we need to solve these problems, whether those are satellite design technologies, whether they're astronomy observation technologies, whether they're debris collection technologies, whatever they might be, we're not investing enough in solving those problems from a technological perspective. We lack the amount of shared data that we need. There are pockets of data, but it's not well shared collaboratively, internationally, across the stakeholders. We have an absence of, st of standards, regulations, and agreements. There just is not a lot of international agreement on this topic. There, there have not been a lot of attempts to get international agreement on this topic. If one country moves forward on its own, let's just say, for example, that the U.S. Congress woke up tomorrow and decided they were going to cap the number of satellites, and you can have this many and no more. There will not be any more. They would just move to another country. So let's be honest about that, right? There is no way for one country to act on its own. This needs to be done collaboratively, internationally, so that we are solving the problem of an international global space. And we have insufficient organization and leadership. 
in my role, that's specifically directed at the U.S. federal agencies where we know there are failures, we know there are weaknesses, there are things that can be improved, but much could be said in the, along the same lines for many other countries and for the international community at large. We presented a policy framework where on the left we talk about our shared challenges, those things I just ran through, and on the right the ultimate goal where the bullseye is with the arrow is to balance the needs of the uh, satellite communications, weather forecasting, and other users that need satellites up in orbit with the astronomy community and other users on the ground who need the valuable scientific information, the cultural connection to the night sky, and so on. There, it's going to be important to balance those two. It isn't either or. It needs to be both. We need to find the win-win wherever it is. And any time you're seeking that in an area that can be contentious, where the needs, as Piero said, are opposed to each other in many ways, it's, it's, everybody's going to have to give a little if we're going to get there. There's no other way to get there. Policy options need to be run at the same time. Often we say, do this, then do this, then do this. But in reality, the time frames here are so long from designing a satellite to putting it into orbit, it lives out its lifetime, it fails at the end of its lifetime, and it re-enters. That's decades. So we need to be working on parallel efforts at the same time. We don't know which ones are going to bear fruit in some cases, and even when we do, we need to have them all operating at once. And then as we continue to collect knowledge, we, we go back and revise, right? So we start with policy that gets us based on what we currently know. Start where we are with the knowledge we have and put policies in place based on that knowledge. And then as we gain more, maybe we started down path A and new knowledge tells us we need to veer off a little bit and head toward path B. That's okay, make an adjustment at that point. Continue to do that. As we gain more knowledge, we adjust the path, we adjust the path, we adjust the path. It's not okay to say we need all the data before we can take any steps. And it's not okay to say we're gonna take our steps and that's it. We need to take the steps we can and continue to adjust over time. Just wanted to mention, again, these are in the slides for when you access those on the website, but we have written two other reports in 2023 on this topic, one directed at the U.S. Federal Communications Commission and its process of environmental review for satellites, which basically doesn't exist. Uh, in 1986, for those who aren't aware, they declared that there would be a categorical exclusion for satellites, and they have not updated it since then. So almost 40 years later, the world has changed a lot in the satellite arena, and they need to revisit that decision. Department of Defense, we also wrote a report on their use of data for space situational awareness. So both of those might be of interest to this community. And with that, I'll just close by saying that this is an international problem and it's gonna call for international collaboration and action, multiple lines in parallel. And as we learn more, we make adjustments. Thank you very much. Still right there. <laughs> So I think you can tell why we asked uh, Karen to be our keynote speaker. She has knowledge of all the areas that we're interested in and she uh, conveyed that quite well. So now we're gonna open the floor for the next few minutes before break uh, to um, um, solicit your questions and we have uh, at least three ways of doing that. Uh, um, we have online, if you're online, please feel free to either raise your hand or put your question in Slack. That's what we would prefer. You can do chat, but we prefer Slack. And if you're here in person, you have the choice of raising your hand in person or um, also putting it on Slack as well uh, if you have your computer in front of you, okay? So we'll take the first question, please. And go ahead, Richard. Did you report the microphone? Oh, 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 Richard? And please state your name first. Richard Green, did your report generate any reaction from members or staff? It did, yes. And it, when you pull down the report online, you'll see the addressees that it was intended for. We did briefings with all of those addressees, so they not only got the written report, they got a briefing and the chance to ask questions. They were very interested. And uh, I think we have some legislation currently in the U.S. Congress trying to address this. How well it will move forward, I don't know, but there was definitely interest. Thank you. Uh, Chris Johnson, Secure World Foundation. I have a question, maybe a kind of an open-ended question. Um, how many of these discussions need to be international? 
And how many need to be uh, just purely national discussions and deliberations and rulemaking? And, and you know, the question is, what needs to be decided uh, on the national level and, and what really needs to be decided and settled on the international level? So that's a really great question that I don't have a great answer for. I think it depends a lot on different nations and their governance structure to start with. And, but, but without a doubt, both are going to be needed. We need changes in the U.S. at the U.S. governance level, for example, reconsidering the exclusion of satellites from any environmental review. But we also need international discussion because, as I mentioned earlier, if you change something and make it harder for operators in one country, they'll, they'll likely move. So we need to work on this internationally. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Ruskin Hartley with Dark Sky International. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on how we get Congress's attention on this. It, it strikes me, um, for instance, with the AI issue, no one was talking about it 12 months ago, and now they've already had hearings in the White House. Like, we have been working on this for four years, and it feels like we haven't broken through yet. And a lot of your discussions is, well, we don't know enough, so we should study it more. How do we break out of this cycle and make this something that people should care about before it's too late? I think if I had the answer to that, I would uh, probably retire a rich person, but I, I don't. Getting Congress's attention, and probably true for the parliaments in many other countries as well, is very difficult. They have a lot on their plate. They have a lot of different things to think about. And importantly, putting yourself in their shoes, they have a lot of constituencies talking to them. So they're not only listening to the astronomers who they do care about, they're also listening to the public. They're listening to satellite operators located in their district who are major employers. They're listening to a lot of people for a lot of reasons. And, and their job is very difficult. Aaron Bowley, Outer Space Institute and University of British Columbia. Thank you for giving your talk. Uh, you mentioned a couple times now about companies getting up and moving. There's uh, an aspect to that that's certainly weird. There are other aspects that's a threat. And so I'm curious about what you see as the balance between them making that threat and what aspect is real. We've seen, for example, the U.S. show real leadership with double haul vessels after the Valdez incident, in which the companies were saying, we're going to get up and leave if you make us do this. And then the Valdez happened. The U.S. said, well, we're going to make you do it anyway. And then the rest of the world followed. And so what, how much of this is real? How much of it is threat? So certainly you're right. That can happen where, where a country or a region puts its foot down and the rest of the world follows suit. It's nice when that happens, and it would be nice if that occurred a little more often, I would say. When we talk to satellite operators, we talk to Starlink, for example, and they express to us very plainly, we want to stay within the U.S. We want to work in the U.S. We do not want to be driven out. But if you make it untenable, right, unprofitable, too hard to do this, then they have to consider what's best for their business. They're not going to stay and fail. And if you think about that as a business operator, that makes sense. So there is a line. Uh, it's not as much of a threat as it sometimes, sometimes used to be because moving is also expensive. But it is an option that's available, I think. Okay. We have time for one more question. Okay. All right. Uh, Lisa Ruth Rand, Caltech. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I have a question that's actually potentially a follow-up to the last one, which is um, in, this, in, in the absence of adequate data to make some of these predictions that you mentioned, um, did you address or, like, or, or look at any analogous environmental context that might help inform paths forward in, in, while waiting for that data to um, arrive? So, so the team did, the team that did this work, of course I signed the report, but uh, that team of physicists and aerospace engineers I mentioned did the work. You all know how that works. Uh, they did review literature in other fields as well, not just in the space field. So I do not know exactly which of their observations were informed by other areas, but I do know they thought about it in a broader context. Well, very, very soon we'll have our break. Do we have just one more little announcement to make? Thank but you. I wanted to, let's thank the speaker again.